Yes, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you that we can study about this topic and choose the best meditation. May you guide us as we listen, help us to be able to focus. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Start me off with a slide, okay? I'm, I'm uh, helpless. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This first slide, we're talking about, well, identifying what is true meditation and fake meditation. Now, what does fake meditation do? You see, uh, most of us, the, the, the name meditation has been hijacked, you know. But when we think of high meditation, it's always like this, right? Sit cross-legged and close your eyes and meditate. And, uh, but meditation is taught to be like that, but it's not, okay? So when you say, do you do meditation? People think, oh, is it yoga? Is it um, uh, transcendental, you know, Zen, you know? That's, that's, well, that's meditative practice uh, method, all right? It's of emptying the mind. So what I'm saying is fake meditation deactivates the control functions of the brain to control the mind, to give the mind a new experience. Now, what kind of experience do you get? So I'm backing up a bit to refresh our memory. On the left are the Eastern type practices practices like breath, breath or mantra or, or, or what's the sound of one hand clapping. So it starves the brain because it causes the mind, the brain to think about nothing. Your brain doesn't think about nothing, but they, they're telling you when your brain is active thinking about everything, it's not good. All right, so it's starving the brain. The amygdala is calm. Oh, this feel good. You feel tranquil because the amygdala is calm. You get more sleep waves. So your mind drifts and you feel at at ease, at peace, because when you're drifting off to sleep, you feel very good. And then there's less blood flow. If you eat too much and the blood goes to your stomach, you feel sleepy. Right? So in yoga nidra, that's exact, exactly what happens to the brain. There's less blood flow to the brain. Right? And then dopamine. Dopamine is addiction. So when you're addicted, you do more and more of this stuff and you love it. And then what happens? It's on the right. It deactivates the frontal lobe. And then that thing in the frontal lobe called the ACC is deactivated. Now, ACC is responsible for love, for hope and optimism, as your will to choose right from wrong. That is deactivated. Now then, because your will is deactivated, there's another part in the frontal lobe called the LFC, the lateral frontal cortex. That's deactivated. Both are deactivated. When even one is deactivated, it is you're open to a suggestion, which is hypnotism. So if you're me meditating with a guru, he can say you're in nirvana and you believe it when you have this amazing experience, which comes from the last item, parietal deactivated. You lose a sense of your body shape, your orientation, your position in three-dimensional space. You feel like you're in, in, in eternity, but time is standing still. So he suggests, because you feel like that, and you're looking for a meaning of why you feel like that? Nirvana. Right? Or in Zen Satori. Or if you're doing Christian meditation, using the same practice, and this thing happens to your mind, you're in the presence of God. So this is where it's very dangerous. Now, brain waves. Sleep waves. They're very natural, right? Before you go to sleep, you get more sleep waves. When you're asleep, you get deeper sleep waves, slow sleep waves. So they're natural. But why? So the question is, how can they be dangerous now? This is uh, Brown's University uh, looking at sleep waves in terms of mindfulness. And this is what they say. Alpha brain waves optimize the power to ignore. Right? And they say specifically these words. When alpha oscillation or alpha brain waves, which are very slow, uh, are prominent, your sensory inputs tend to be minimized. Yeah, you get less input because you are in a sleep mode. You're not taking input. Neuroscientists at Brown University are doing research on how the brain achieves optimal inattention. <laughs> it makes you more and more inattentive. Optimize it. That's what sleep waves do to you. Uh, if you have sleep waves now, a lot of it, you can't focus exactly on what I'm saying. Uh, you hear a bit, you, you hear 10%. Yeah, optimal inattention. 
the Browns University researchers hope that teaching people how to harness the power to ignore by creating alpha brain state through mindfulness. Now, mindfulness, now, see, very harmless, right? And, yes. <laughs> and, and lost. Can you slow down a bit? And I think this is really, very really useful. Okay, I'll a bit, slow down. A bit, a bit too fast. Okay. Yeah, All right, I'll slow down. Okay, Thank what you. Brown's Thank University you. is saying is that when you meditate, you get a lot more sleep wish. And when you have sleep wish, you cannot concentrate. And you know when you're drifting off to sleep, you cannot concentrate. When I drift off to sleep, my wife would say, hey, Kopto, you're not listening, are you? <laughs> So those are sleep waves, okay? And so Brown's University says it's optimal inattention. In other words, it maximizes your inattention and therefore you can ignore problems, <laughs> okay? You're at peace, you're sleeping, you're drifting, so you love it. So that's what mindfulness does. That's Brown's University, okay? Now, a psychiatrist, Brendel, he says, Mindfulness can be used because it's optimized in attention. Can be used to, for you to ignore your problems. Big problems can be ignored. For example, this is his quote. Some people use mindfulness strategies to avoid critical thinking. Critical thinking tasks. Because they're so pressured, right? Uh, they're working too hard. They don't want to think anymore. So you use mindfulness. That's fine. You relax and use mindfulness. But it can be used for even, and I, I continue reading, I've worked with clients who instead of rationally thinking through a career challenge or ethical dilemma, wow, maybe I know uh, uh, things are not going quite right. People are asking for bribes. Shall I give bribe or not? Right. This is an ethical dilemma, right? This people may use mindfulness, and when they do mindfulness because they stress, they would, the, the use of mindfulness can be to disconnect from their challenges and retreat into a meditative mindset. So the meditative mindset is power to ignore, you know, to ignore challenges which you have to face, some of these challenges, or even ethical dilemma. I'm, and I make a joke at this stage. I said, if you have a big quarrel with your mother-in-law and she meditates and you meditate, you both can, don't have to confront the problems <laughs> in your life. You can just meditate and you'll go away. <laughs> All right, so that is a power to ignore. Now, the power to ignore is very much captured on the left. Now, the Dalai Lama, I have posted this before, right? The Dalai Lama asks, what is love? And he says, love is the absence of judgment. But what it captures is the whole Eastern meditative happenings, the, the, the attitude towards life. It's non-judgmental. It is what it is. See, whatever rises in your mind, it's just a mental phenomena. It is what it is. There's no need to judge whether it's right or wrong. It's just give attention to it. It just arose, right? It's pure awareness. That is the Eastern worldview. Now, the Western or not, the Christian worldview, the biblical worldview is on the right. And I'll talk more about King David in meditation. He wanted to open his heart to God for God to show him his faults. Now, sometimes, you know, oftentimes we're arrogant without knowing it. When you're arrogant, you think you're right. And so these are secret faults. We, we think we're right when we're wrong. And King David in meditation said to God, God, you know, show it to me. And he said, God, show me my presumptuous sins. When I presume I'm a good Christian, I'm walking with God, I'm God's man, maybe I think too well of myself. Maybe there are faults and, and, and sins that I'm hiding from myself. God, you show it to me. So these are, on the left and right, are two complex. Completely different mindsets. Okay? So, one kind of meditation gets you to confront your problems. The other one hides everything away. So, which one do you want? And I suspect I'm speaking to a lot of Christians. Which one do you really want? Okay. 
So we have to learn biblical meditation only after knowing the Bible, because the Bible is, you know, King David, when he was meditating just now on, on Psalms 19, he was meditating on the law, on the statutes, on God's judgment. Well, you've got to really know the Bible to meditate on that stuff. So, biblical meditation and meditation on the, meditating on the Word of God. Okay? So, you've got to know the Bible before you meditate. Okay? Now, Hebrews 5, 12 to 14, I'm going to read, right? For when... For when, for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again. I mean, means you're not mature as a Christian, right? You don't know the word. You need to be taught again. Which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as have need for milk. You still need milk. Not of strong meat. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of God in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Okay, now, but strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, mature Christians, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So for King David, it was about discerning good and evil, his secret faults. Right, so we don't think that, oh, because you don't need, you, you don't know the Bible very well, but when you meditate, you'll discover God within. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't happen that way. All right? So let's not think that uh, meditation, uh, the practice, the ritual, is a way to God. It's not. I'll show you why. I'll show you how it is used by some so-called experts, and it doesn't work, and why it doesn't work. All right? So it's centered on the Word of God. Now, now, Romans 6, 4, 5. When do you become a child of God? Now, this is the born again experience in Romans 6. And then Philippians 3. I'm going to read. I'm going to emphasize some words that I'm reading, right? You look at the word together. Likeness. And then conformable. Okay? Now, I'm going to read the text. And you see the meaning of these red words. And I'm going to... Talk about them. Therefore, we are buried with him. Now, this is the born again experience, a true experience, authentic one. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, this is born again. We are together with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. Together. Okay. Planted together. Because he came as a man to allow us to plant ourselves together with him. Philippians 3.10 That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. Now, we know that God loves us. Why? Because he hung on that cross for us. He loves us. And we can see the strength of his love by going to the cross. But we must also see the strength of his love is equal to the strength of his hatred for sin. That's why he hung on the cross. So, as strong as his love is for us, his hatred for sin is as, just as strong. So, when we are to be planted together, I know the words in red, in the likeness of his death and his resurrection, when we, we come to the cross, we feel the strength of his love, but at the same time, we must be conformable to his death. In other words, we must also feel that hatred for sin which we, with which we come to the cross to repent. And then the power of the cross works for you. Two things. The, his love 
and will humble us to the point that we will see the gravity, the awfulness of our sin. As much as he loves, he hates sin. We must hate sin to be conformable and to be together in his likeness at the cross. Then we will be released from our sin. Now, that's the power of the cross. Now, when we have this experience, authentic experience, actually, we don't need <laughs> to meditate, the fake meditation to bring us into oneness with Christ. Yeah, so th this is a powerful experience with which we realize that there is nothing more powerful and we do not need fake meditation. So what is fake meditation? It came from, and we talked about this, came from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You see, Christ at the cross made a big difference about how we should see life. There is sin. There is righteousness and there is sin. Big difference. Right? His love is because he loves you, yes, but he hates sin equally. So there's a big difference about what is right and what's wrong, sin and righteousness. Big difference. I hope you can sense that at the cross. Now, what Satan said to Eve at the tree of knowledge of good and evil was completely different. So God said to Adam and Eve, listen, there's only one thing that you mustn't do in this perfect garden. Don't eat of that tree. But the serpent seduced Eve. And as Eve was walking by, he said, Eve, come and walk, come and eat my tree. And Eve says, no, no, no. God said, I can't and I will die. And the serpent said, you will not die. Then he said, for God doth know. In other words, God knows what I'm saying to you. God said you'll die, but I know what God knows. You won't die. In other words, Satan is speaking to Eve now in the place of God. There's no difference. Uh, his place is where all the boundaries between right and wrong and sin and righteousness is broken in a few sentences. He, he's basically saying to, to Eve, there is no difference between God and me. There's no difference between the fruits. There's no difference between the tree. I know what God knows. There's no difference between life and death. You won't die. There's no, no such thing as death. And then when you eat thereof, your eyes will be open. You will, when you come over to my side, you will in fact realize you're still God. You leave God and you're still God. There's no difference. And then he said, knowing good and evil. He did not mean, if you come away from God and you will know good, the difference between good and evil. He says, on my side, there's no difference. In fact, he said, sin and live. There's no difference with sin and righteousness. That's what has happened. Now, the meditators, the Eastern meditators, will teach you this. No difference. No difference. I will show you how they teach it. Because your mind, when your ACC goes down, what's your ACC? Your will. Choose right from wrong. It's deactivated. You can't even choose right from wrong. So you're at risk. And then there's hypnotism, suggestion. But the, the words of Satan captures everything that they're teaching. Now, biblical Christianity teaches atonement. God makes an atonement. So what is this atonement? There's judgment. It's the two sides of the same coin. There's judgment and there's oneness. See, why is there judgment? Because there's right, right and wrong. God will judge the wicked separate them and be one, at one with his own people, the righteous. So judgment is good. Atonement is very good. So what I'm saying is, at the bottom, separating God's righteousness, so, sorry, separating God's righteous people from the wicked. That's what judgment is. And that's the atonement. So we want to be like King David, no right from wrong, open our hearts to God. That is meditation. Okay, now I want to talk about George Fox University. It's a university in the US. And I talked earlier for some of you who were, were there, Lighthouse Trails. And you see the, 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 the word Lighthouse Trails, the website at the bottom? 
Lighthouse Trails Research. All right, now, this, is, this information is from Lighthouse Trails. Tremendous website, tells you everything you need to know who's doing the wrong thing on fake meditation. All right, now, George Fox University is a hub of contemplative emerging activity. And this false type of church, of meditative church, is called the emerging church. And so, George Fox, uh, this uh, Lighthouse Trails is saying this is an, an emerging activity with a list of adjunct professors that include, uh, you may know some of these, work, these names, and I hope you do, Dan Kimball, and Le now the ones that I've highlighted, like Lennon Sweet, I'm going to talk about, okay? In 2005, George Fox hired Todd Hunter, Leonard Sweet, Brian McLaren to teach certain classes. And chapel speakers at university have included Richard Foster and Braden, Brennan Manning, recommended and required reading for classes at George Fox include a wide assortment of staunch contemplative mystics like Thomas Keating. Uh, last week we talked about Thomas Keating, Henry Nowen, and Thomas Merton. Uh, Henry Nowen is a Jesuit. Uh, Thomas Keating and Thomas Merton are Catholic monks. Okay, now I'm going to talk about these names which are highlighted. Okay, what they believe. Now this is McLaren. Protestant, mind you, okay? Uh, he says this, because they want to blend Christianity with other religion. And this is what he says. We look, we could look at Gandhi, his life, as an example of self-sacrificial love. Or Martin Luther King, Jr.'s life. There would be a lot of people we could look at. And so, wouldn't it be better to just talk about Jesus as one among many? Not unique, huh? Jesus Christ as one among many, rather than lift him up as extraordinary example. Because by doing that, we create, we perpetuate this Christian elitism and exclusive vism. Right? So Jesus is no special. Let's not be too proud. Let's get humble and be like everybody. That's Brian McLaren. He's the one of the top gurus of the emerging contemplatives, right? Now, Brian McLaren also says this. I must add, though that I don't believe making disciples must equal making adherence to the Christian religion, it may be advisable in many, not all, circumstances to help people become followers of Jesus and remain within their Buddhist, Hindu, and Jewish context. So, you can be still a Buddhist and you follow Jesus. That's what he's saying. All right, so you can see this blending of religion. All right, true meditation. Now, Brian McLaren is a, a, a contemplative uh, uh, leader. Okay? Now, this is Leonard Sweet. A famous people okay? on the right about him. The author, this is Leonard Sweet, of more than 200 articles, 1,300 plus published sermons, and more than 60 books. Leonard Sweet's publications include the bestsellers Soul Tsunami, Aqua Church, Jesus Manifesto. Now, what does he say? Let's read on the left what he says. A surprising central feature of all the world's religion is the language of light in communicating the divine and symbolizing the union of human with the divine. Muhammad's lighted light-filled cave, Moses' burning bush, Paul's blinding light, Fox's inner light, Krishna's lord of light, Bohm's light-filled cobbler shop, Plantinus' fire experience, but Buddha's with the flow of kundalini fire erupting from their frontal lobe. Yeah, all light are same. The burning bush, God's light is the same as everybody's light. And these are Protestants, huh? famous, huh? <laughs> author of how many books? 60 books. Now, Leonard Sweet's book, Quantum Spirituality, page 300. Keep breathing, not beating a beating, should be breathing, breathing quietly while looking, while holding your Bible. You have within you only the powers of goodness resident in the great spiritual leaders, 
like Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Lao Tzu. So he, he mixes Jesus with Muhammad and Lao Tzu. These are the powers of goodness. And as you breathe, you get their power of righteousness. But he says, you also have within you the forces of evil and destruction. Resident in each breath you take is the body of angels like Joan of Arc and devils like Giles de Rais, Genghis Khan, Judas, Herod, Hitler, Stalin, and all the other destructive spirits throughout the world. So what he's saying, <laughs> as you breathe, you're breathing in good and bad. Good and bad spirit. So you are good and evil. Combine. And so Leonard Sweet goes on. Quantum spirituality bonds us to all creation, as well as to other members of the human family. This entails a radical doctrine of embodiment of God in every substance of creation. In other words, God is in everything that he created, in the flowers and the trees and the air, in every human being. So there's no difference. It's whether you realize it or not. And in any case, you're holding your Bible and breathing in, you're both good and evil anyway. So everybody's united. There's no difference. No difference. This sounds so much like the serpent in Eden. And then he continues, but a spirituality that is not in some way entheistic or pan, panentheistic. Now, the word pan is pandemic, everybody, right? Pa panentheistic means God is in everything. That does not extend to the spirit and matter of the cosmos is not Christian. In other words, God is in everything. You must know that. Okay? So, when God is in everything, and he's in every human, whether good or bad, <laughs> then God doesn't distinguish between good or bad. So there's no difference between every human being. That's why we can all be united. That's Brian McLaren's thoughts and Leonard Sweet. And now that's Richard Foster. And he says, if you feel we live in a purely physical universe, you will view meditation as a good way to obtain a consistent alpha brain wave pattern. How do you do, get a consistent alpha brain wave pattern, which is sleep wave? Now you remember what Brown's University said. It gives you the power to ignore. And when you do meditation with sleep waves, before long, you will go into your parietal going down and you have this dramatic experience. So it's just one step after another. And the addiction leads you deeper and deeper. And so Richard Foster continues to say this Christianizing silence and absence of thought. So when we meditate like King David did on the statutes, on the law of God and judgments, hey, that's filling your word, your mind with the word of God. But then Richard Foster talks about silence. All right. He says, progress in intimacy with God means progress towards silence. It is this recreating silence, this power to recreate, to which we are called in contemplative prayer. So contemplative prayer it was invented by Thomas Merton. And we quoted Thomas Merton last week. And we'll probably quote him again today, right? So silence. Parietal goes down, frontal lobe goes down, can't distinguish. And it's called recreating. And Thomas Keating on the, on the right says, silence is God's first language. Everything else is poor translation. <laughs> so the Bible in English is poor translation. <laughs> silence is most important. That's what they are teaching. Now, this is Richard Raw, Father Richard Raw. Okay? Now, I'm going to mute someone. Now, he says he's teaching non-dual Christianity. All right? Remember? Non-dual is like yin yang. And you know, Bapomet, remember? Uh, there's no difference between the Ten Commandments and Bapomet. Everything is not two, but one. Good and evil, heaven and hell. Uh, there's no right, no wrong. Okay? Now, but he, he's not saying there's no right, no wrong. Right? See, he is a Catholic um, uh, priest, right? But he's saying we need to 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 go away from differentiating ourselves with other people 
right? And he says, and he gave this example, right? He said, Jesus is 100% divine and 100% human. Now, we all agree with that, right? Christians could never understand how Jesus can be 100% human and 100% divine. Christians can't understand that, but he said, but we were just told to believe it. But what he's saying is, if you do Eastern meditation, non-dual, 100% divine, 100% human, you will be using Eastern meditation to combine the two. That's called non-dual Christianity. So, then he said in red, it took the East meditation and contemplation to help us Christians understand it. So, you can't be a Christian until you do it. Meditation that merges two into one, though they may be opposite. That's what he's teaching. Now, he writes his books, and one of his books is called Breathing Underwater. See, they want to change everything, uh, dissolve all the boundaries, not just right and wrong, but physical boundaries as if you can breathe underwater. So his book is called Breathing Underwater. And another book is called Falling Upwards. When you fall, you fall. Right? This is natural law. But he goes against the natural law to scramble your mind <laughs> to think that you're falling upwards. So this is the, uh, the, the ridiculous state of mind when people go into meditation and they lose their orientation. Uh, orientation tells you where you are. Right? You fall, you fall downwards. That's orientation. <laughs> so when the parietal goes down, you lose your orientation. So you can fall Upwards. <laughs> okay? Now, Richard Rohr. Now, Julian of Norwich is a mystic. Right? Contemplative mystic. And so Richard Rohr adores Julian of Norwich. And he says, Greatly ought we to rejoice that God dwells in our soul. In every man, you know. He's saying in every man, not just in Christians. Okay? And more greatly, we ought to rejoice that our soul dwells in God. Our soul is created to be God's dwelling place, and the dwelling place of soul is God. There is what we call interbeing. In other words, God and man are one. Right? Just like uh, Land of Sweet. Okay? Just like Hindu, Hinduism, Om. Okay? So, then he talks about Julian of Norwich. She, Julian of Norwich, is a pantheist. Now, pantheist believes... No, no. She is not a pantheist. Julian of Norwich believes in God the person. She is not believing in energy is everybody, therefore all is God. She is not a pantheist. She is, she is not saying everything is God, like people who believe in chi. She is saying everything is in God and God is in everything, which is panentheism. All right, so God, the person, is in every man. <laughs> There's no dis differentiation be between any man, between man of one religion, man of another. All can be united. Now, Richard Walsh has this famous uh, quote, right? And let's read it very carefully. Some, way, some of you may even agree with it. That that's what I'm concerned about. Every time God forgives us, God is saying that God's own rules or law do not matter as much as the relationship that God wants to create with us. In other words, when God forgives us, He doesn't care about His own rules. He wants that relationship with us. Now, we just read about born-again experience, the true experience of Christ on the cross. He loves us, yes, infinitely, incomparably, immeasurably. But in the, at the same strength with which he loves us, he hates him. So we must come in the likeness planted together, conformable to his heart, who he is. And then we receive that forgiveness. We experience that forgiveness. But um, Richard Ross says it's very different. Huh? When God forgives us, he's saying, my own rules don't matter. So in other words, what is sin? Sin is, uh, in 1 John 3, 4 at the bottom, I'm reading, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is a transgression of the law. So there are rules, there are laws. And sin is defined as a transgression of the law. So if rules don't matter, 
then the cross doesn't matter. <laughs> you know why Jesus is hanging there? Because of our sin. And a sinner must hang upon a tree. That, those are the rules. He hung because he obeyed the law. He complied with the law. He conformed with the law. So, in a few words, you know, people like uh, Richard Rohr can just give something so smooth, so beautiful, and everything that we have thought about in the Bible, even being the born again experience, what it really is, is gone. Right. So, these on the right, I, I, I took it from Renovar. Renovare, as an organization by Richard Rohr, okay? And they group together all these contemplatives and they promote their books. And so on the left are the books that are promoted. The Return of the Prodigal Son by Henry J. Nguyen, a New Age Jesuit priest. The Seven Story Mountain by Thomas Merton. <laughs> Last week, we heard him speak very much like the serpent. The spiritual exercise of Ignatius Loyola. To, to, today we will have a quote from Loyola, and you judge for yourself. And he is the founder of the Jesuit order, order. The Dark Knight of the Soul, George Fox, Thomas A. Kempis, Brother Lawrence, Richard Foster. So these are the books and the names I have mentioned we are, we are talking about today. So you can judge for yourself. And then we've got Richard Raw with Father Thomas Keating. Yeah, they are at the same conferences, they are buddies, they have the same mindset, they have the same teaching. And then, of course, you know, at the top, you got, got Brown's University about all alpha oscillations, how it causes you, gives you the power to ignore. And then Richard Foster at the bottom, right, talking about alpha brain, promoting alpha brain, uh, brain waves and then also con uh, promoting contemplative prayer in red. And who, are, who, who was the founder of contemplative prayer? Thomas Merton. And Thomas Merton is the man who said, I don't see any difference between Buddhism and Christianity, and I want to be as good a Buddhist as I possibly can. So all these things are coming together. Right? This unity of religion. Now, Pope Francis went to the U.S., he was accepted. For the first time, a Pope spoke to Congress. And what did Pope Francis say to Congress? He told Congress, your job is to unite people and religion. So on the left, he said, this is his words, okay? Another temptation which we must especially guard against, the simplistic reductionism which sees only good and evil, or if you will, righteous and sinner. You only, he's saying to Congress, you only see good and evil and righteous and sinner. You must guard against this distinction, this difference. Because if you make this difference, you can't unite people and religion. Okay? So then he said, you must confront every polarization. So good and evil is a polarization. Righteous and sinner is a polarization. You must confront every polarization. You must not think about people like that. And then he said on the, on the right, he, and he talks about Father Thomas Merton, was also a man of dialogue, a promoter of peace between people and religion. Father Thomas Merton sows peace in the contemplative style of Father Thomas Merton. He said to Congress, you must sow peace in the contemplative style of Thomas Merton. In other words, Congress, there's Father Thomas Merton who's uniting Buddhism and Hindu uh, and Christianity, you know, Father Thomas uh, is, is breaking the boundaries, the differences between good and evil and righteous and sinner. To unite, you've got to follow the contemplative style. Why? How do we know this is bad now as, as I talk to you? Because in contemplation, in Eastern meditation, the frontal lobe goes down and you lose your will. You cannot tell the difference between right and wrong. You cannot tell between sin and righteousness. <laughs> okay? So, this is what is, is happening. Now, here is a quote from St. Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuit order. Okay, let's read, okay? This is a quote about his practices, Ignatian contemplation. There is no longer sacred or profane. 
Wow. No longer any difference between sacred and profane. Natural or supernatural? Mortification or prayer? Because it is one and the same spirit who brings it about that the Christian will see and love God in all things and all things in God. Now, he's a Catholic, so he must believe in the person of God. So God is in everyone. Everyone, whoever you may be, righteous or sinner, no difference, no difference, no difference. And this is called love. And the Christian must see this. That's what he said. Christian will see. Must see. So this is Ignatian spirituality. He's a Jesuit, founder of that order. Okay? Ah, I think I skipped. Uh, I hope again. Okay, now this is Pope Francis. Now, when he was appointed Pope, uh, this is what UK Telegraph wrote about him, right? And also the Jesuit colleges. So first quote is, Francis is a Jesuit, and his long and arduous formation as a priest was found on the spiritual exercises of Ignatius. So we just read St. Ignatius' exercises, God in all things. Right. No difference between the sacred and the profane. <laughs> No difference between people. You got to unite everybody. Don't make a difference. Okay. Okay. The second quote To think that the leader of the Catholic Church is one who follows in the tradition of Ignatius, whose life has been devoted to finding God in all things. Panentheism. That is who they all are. That is what Ignatian spiritual is. All right. Now, recently, just recently, the Pope uh, wanted to reach the Amazon, South America. And then he had this to say in his, uh, well, his, they call it, uh, oh, I, encyclical, I think, uh, Curera Amazonia, okay? And this is his quote. He is present, now God is present, in a glorious and mysterious way in the river, the trees, the fish, and the wind. As the Lord who reigns in creation without ever losing his transfigured wounds while in the Eucharist. So God is also in the Eucharist. He takes up the elements of this world and confers on all the things the meaning of the Paschal gift. So the highlighted means God is in everything. God the person is in everything. Okay, now, is this panentheism? Is this pantheism? And in reaching the Amazon, they took a, 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 a wooden carving of, from the Amazon of a pregnant woman, a naked woman, and they had all kinds of ceremonies. And then his own Catholics, uh, traditional Catholics, were so offended with this that a young Catholic man stole the statue and threw it down the Tiber, into the Tiber of Rome, and became an instant hero. Right? People didn't like this. The traditional Catholics didn't like this. But the Pope is doing it. And so one of his own um, theologians, this is Nicol Monsignor Nicholas Nicola Bux. He said, the, the church slips into pantheism with Pope Francis in the Amazon excitation. His own theologian says, this is pantheism. Now, it's amazing stuff. Before the, the Pope spoke to... Um, Congress, the day before he spoke to the United Nations. And after he spoke, a singer, I uh, can't remember his name now, sang him a song, a famous singer. And the song was John Lennon's, and if you're old enough, you'll know this song from the Beatles. Imagine there's no heaven. Okay? Now, and the key lyrics in the song are in red. Imagine there's no heaven. Now, remember, Pope hit a religion. Hit of Catholic Church is receiving this song in his honor. And the first words of this song is Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try, no hell either below us. <laughs> okay? Uh, above us, only sky, and so forth and so forth. And then on the right, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion too. No heaven, no hell, no religion. And then he goes on If you have all these things, John Lennon singing, 
and the world will live as one. So if you don't differentiate between good and evil, <laughs> heaven and hell, and no religion, all religion are one, well, the world lives as one. Now, where did this inspiration for this song for John Lennon come from? 1968, 67, 65, John Lennon and the Beatles were many, uh, meditating with Maharishi Guru. I was in London. That's when I picked up Zen. So, Maharishi Guru, meditation, tells you there is no difference. All the boundaries are broken, you know. Good and evil, heaven and hell, no religion. If there is no religion, no heaven and hell, we all live in harmony. So, Pope Francis was honored with this song. Now, the Pope doesn't go anywhere and be surprised. And the United Nations and, and Pope Francis are very close. He knew this song was coming. But isn't it so appropriate for him? <laughs> because he sees God in all things anyway. So his philosophy, his thoughts are in all that is around him. So, Dalai Lama, right? What is love? Love is the absence of judgment, non judgmental, no difference. What it is, is what it is. There's no right, no wrong. It just reflects that the meditative technique actually brings down the frontal lobe, brings down the ACC, gives you a parietal experience. Ah, the, all the whole world is one, and we are all one. That's how dangerous it is. Now, the Bible, what does it say? Light for darkness and darkness for light. Don't do that. Make a big difference between light and darkness. Laodicea, neither hot nor cold. Don't be neither hot nor cold. Don't blend hot and cold until you can't tell the difference because the lukewarm water is spat out by Christ. Now, apostate Israel. What did apostate Israel do? You know, Satan said to Israel, yes, worship God, it's okay. Worship God, but also worship me. <laughs> Make no difference. And Elijah had to come. Make a difference. Choose you this day. And then the quote, and they that shall teach my people the difference between holy and the profane and cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. Ezekiel said that. Can you remember what Ignatius said? There's no difference between the profane and the holy. So, that kind of meditation takes you into the opposite dimension. And so God, in Malachi 2.17, is inspiring the prophet to say this. You all, Israel, you have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, wherein have we wearied him? When you say everyone that doeth evil is good. In other words, God doesn't make a difference between good and evil. In the sight of the Lord. And he delighteth in them. He delighteth even in the one who does evil. Then Ezekiel asked the question, where is the God of judgment? God is not God. God is the God of judgment. He is not God if he's like that. Now, King David, we talked about him meditating, right? This is Psalms 19. Now, how did he get to this last verses in Psalms 19? This, this verses, who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Skip back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be upright and be innocent from the great transgression, from great sin. This was the last verse of Psalms 19. But he began... He began meditating. What did, he, what did he see? He meditated on the sun and the moon and the stars. And he saw the sun like a bridegroom. A bridegroom. He's meditating and visualizing a wedding, a bridegroom. And the sun was like a bridegroom and a strong man who come to run a race. And then he meditated on the statutes, on the law and judgment. And he said, these things, the law, the judgments, are very good. They give us reward and they're sweet as honey. Now, imagine, think, he's looking at a wedding scene. Now, he's 
thinking that the bridegroom is Christ, is going to come for his bride, and King David is going to be one of the bride. One of many. <laughs> one of the many who are Christians, who are faithful Christians. And then he began, because he meditated on the law and the statutes, he began to, it ha had an impact on him. And he began to feel maybe he cannot see a lot of his faults. But God can. So he appealed to God, God, I'm going to make myself transparent to you. I'm going to open my heart, search my heart, tell me my errors, my faults. This is his meditation, remember? <laughs> the Eastern meditation, oh, no, no difference. It is what it is. Apart from his faults, he wanted to know his presumptuous sins. If I am not who I should be before God, let me know. I want to put everything right because there's going to be a wedding. <laughs> so this is not works, my dear friends. This is grace. This is love. There's a wedding. So he didn't, he wanted to be upright, to be innocent of great sin. This is Bible meditation. And that's why I quoted what I quoted just now about the new birth experience, the authentic one. We must be in the planted in his likeness. Right? We must plant it together. We must be conformable to the cross to his love, and to also to his hatred for sin. And then all is forgiven. Now, the false meditation. And this is Karl Rana, a Jesuit. And he says, he says the Christian of the future will be a mystic, or he will not exist at all. <laughs> Religion is obsolete. You are either mystical or you're nothing at all. Why? Because it's panentheism. There's no difference. God is in all, in every man, whether you're Christian or Hindu. Or if you don't believe in God at all, you still got God in you. Although you haven't discovered it. So what is this at one moment they're talking about? It's the satanic at one moment. They're drawing all people back, not to the tree of life, but the tree of knowledge of neither knowledge of good and evil. There's no difference. So Zephaniah proclaimed this to Jerusalem and Judah. In Zephaniah 1.7, he said, Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And five verses later, he says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their lease that their mind is so settled like sediment in water. You stir them up, they muddy the pool. And then before long, they settle in the same place. These people, their mind is so settled and say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. The Lord doesn't care. The Lord makes no difference. This is, they make God, Yahweh, into Bapomet. So, how are we Christians to think of ourselves? Right? Now, that, that circle on the left is how Christians think about themselves, their soul, their body, and their spirit. But the correct interpretation in this uh, uh, picture that I got, this, this circle that I got from Google uh, 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 images, is the spirit part is spiritual God consciousness. Yeah? King David was meditating. He was conscious of the law of God. He was conscious of the statutes. He was meditating and it was God consciousness. It was not like God is in him. <laughs> but God had caused him to be very conscious of his relationship with God. His two-way relationship with God. So in that red arrow down there, I've got consciousness going two ways. Right? So consciousness of Calvary, consciousness of the new birth, consciousness that we have to be have enmity against that undifferentiated oneness, consciousness of the true atonement. That is God consciousness. So we meditate 
and we have consciousness of the Word of God. And the God of Word is a lot. Huh? All right, so this is the correct perspective. Now, this God consciousness is very important because in Philippians 2.5, at the top, we read this. Let this mind be in you also, which was also in Christ Jesus. We can have the mind of Christ. Amazing as this statement is, we can. That's the assurance. So, what do we meditate on to have that mind? In Psalms on the left, Psalms and Joshua and Psalms again, we meditate just like King David did on the work of God, on the law of God, on the statutes of God, on the way of God. And why, if we meditate on the word and the law and statutes of God, we can have the mind of God? Now, I was then researching, how is God perfect? Uh, on the right, how is God perfect? And what does Deuteronomy and Psalms and Kings and Samuel says? God is perfect in his work, right? in his law, in his statutes, in his way. So God is perfect in how he deals with us, how he deals with Israel, how he hung his own son on the cross. So when we meditate on the perfection of God, we imitate be, by beholding, you become changed. So when you fill your mind with who God is, who, truly, who he truly is, not imagination, you know, but as the Bible speaks, then we are meditating on also on the left, work and law, etc. And therefore, if we imitate, we become changed by God's word. Just like King David. Now, this is true meditation. Now, Henry Newman, Catholic priest, says this. Today, I personally believe that while Jesus came to open the door to God's house, all, all uh, human beings can walk through that door. Whether they know about Jesus or not. Today, I see it as my call to help every person claim his or her own way to God. You claim your own way, you know. <laughs> All can walk through that door, you know, whether whatever religion you are. Okay, then the, the next quote on this, on, in the middle. Through the discipline of contemplative prayer, which is Eastern style meditation, Christian leaders have to learn to listen to the voice of love. For Christian leadership to be truly fruitful in the future, a movement from the moral to the mystical is required in the name of Jesus. You don't have to be moral and moral. What's right and wrong? <laughs> oh, you go to the mystical, where there's no right and no wrong. That's how you get united. Okay. So Henry Nguyen's famous quote is, the God on the right, the God who dwells in our inner sanctuary, a heart of hearts is the same as the one who dwells in the inner sanctuary of human being. He's in every man. Because on the left, he said, in all human beings. That's their belief. It sounds very loving. So what these people on the right here, Taoism, Hinduism, Catholicism, St. Ignatius of Loyola, Christianity of some sort, uh, some Christians, Thomas Keating, Thomas Merton, Yoga, Samadhi, Thich Nhat Hanh, they believe, they put God in everything, in every man, irrespective of who you are. And in that way, you unite the world. So, what is the common denominator of all these things? The immortal soul. If you believe that you have the immortal soul, even after the fall, after Eden, you still are immortal. And only who is immortal? God is immortal in, in Timothy. It says that only God is immortal. Then we believe we can. The immortal soul is in every religion, but it's not in biblical religion. And we talked about it last week. Okay? So if you get rid of the false idea of immortal soul, there is nothing to meditate about, you know? You can't do Eastern meditation. <laughs> do you realize that? So the common denominator of false meditation is the immortal soul or the God within, or the inner divinity, as in Hinduism. So hybrid meditation is possible. So the immortal soul is the bridge from the East into the Western civilization, into Western Christianity. That's how I see it. So Eden, 
the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it was the serpent's at one moment to bring everybody, everyone possible, including the elect if they are deceived, into oneness there. Now, I'm looking at the time. We started at 4.30, it's 5.30. It's 5.30 already. Okay, I'll tell you what. I, I have a few more slides, but they are kind of like uh, a bit superfluous. I don't have to go through them all. And uh, I want to end. I think you've seen enough. Now, here, here is this, this two pictures, okay? I want to emphasize. On the right, if it is God consciousness, there's no risk. Because you're conscious, you've got to study, you've got to meditate on the word of God. You are protected. But on the left is the center. Is, if the center is Om, as in Hinduism, the inner divinity, God is within. Or if a lot of these people, like I've highlighted those uh, highlight yellow words, uh, names like Merton Keating, Freeman, Raw, Novan, Rana, and all that, they insert God in every man, just like Om. Then there's a high risk. That is spiritualistic practice. Okay? But God consciousness is no risk. It is not spiritualistic practices. And spiritualism, here's a quote from a very inspired writer. Okay, And this inspired writer says, little by little, Satan has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. At the end of time, it will get worse. And you will see this kind of spiritualism. Now, this kind of spiritualism is like respected, you know. I mean, meditation is like a big thing in the world's most famous bank, Goldman Sachs. <laughs> the queue to learn meditation, the wrong meditation, is so long that even in a year, it cannot be fulfilled in Goldman Sachs. Okay? Now, I'll tell you the story of Fenway Park. This is my... Last slide, okay? And why am I telling you this story? They said, uh, the experts were, were, were looking at this Fenway Park, looking at the volume of this park, you know, how much space and cubic centimeters it has. And they said, if you block out all the drainage holes, huh, the drains, you block it up and you put one milliliter or one cc of, they call it magic water. And this magic water, one cc becomes two cc's in one minute, not one second, huh? one minute. And you put this magic water, one cc only in the middle of the field, and you block out all the drains. One cc in one minute becomes two, and two becomes four in another minute, and four becomes eight, and so forth. And they calculated that in 45 minutes, this whole field will be under five feet of water. <laughs> Okay, because this water replicates so fast. Now, if I took one of you and handcuffed you in one of the seats 80 feet high, all right, the five feet of water is five feet of water now. I'm handcuffing you and give you the key, five, 80 feet high, and you're sitting there and you're watching this water rise. All right, now, how many more minutes before you have to uncuff yourself and get out, or the water will drown you. The water is rising very fast. Every minute, it replicates. Now, 45 minutes is five feet. In one more minute, how many feet will it be? From five to 10. In another minute, it goes from 10 to 20. In one more minute, 20 to 40. In four more minutes, 40 comes to 80. In four minutes, you have to let yourself go or you drown. Now, why am I telling you this story? Since the Garden of Eden, since Vatican II, when the Roman Church accepted Buddhism and Hinduism as ways to God, a lot of things have happened. Jin Yang is practiced by all aunties and athletes. Yin Yang is in the mind of the kings in the flag of Korea, in Korean airlines. <laughs> All right. uh, Non-dual is being preached to Congress. Contemplative prayer is being preached to Congress. Meditation is in Goldman Sachs. 
But Paul Matt is in Detroit, opposite the Ten Commandments. And I could go on and on. So, how deep is the water now? Since the fall of Eden, it is in every religion. I'm saying it's so deep. And moving upwards so fast that it's not about, are you doing meditation or not? <laughs> it's spiritualism, this kind of spiritualism going. What about other forms of spiritualism? That's what we're faced with. We face with a worldwide, global, spiritualistic deception expressed in meditation, yes, also in Tai Chi, also in yoga, also in Pope Francis, also in Ignatian spirituality. The signs and the, the markings and the symbols are in yin yang, in the Korean flag, in Greek philosophy. No, where is truth? Is it thesis or antithesis? No, it's in the middle, it's in the blending synthesis. So this is where we are, my friends. We are in deep trouble and we don't know it. And Christianity is taking it up, taking up this meditation. Uh, now I've got to stop recording. Okay.